questions to start the workshop off with today that were emailed in through the week here. Um, so I have the first question that came in here. So I'm going to answer these in the order in which they get emailed in. So our first question today is a uh, multi-part, uh, multi-component uh, signal here. So the first part um, is that, uh, you know, as described here, the moving average. So I guess, let me start by this. These descriptions are for a long setup, for a long trade signal here. So first part is we want the <clears throat> moving average to be green. And just so everybody knows, the color of an indicator cannot be red. So NinjaTrader does not allow the color of a plot to be read by another indicator. So Bloodhound can't tell what color um, an indicator is. But from looking at the screenshot, you know, it looks um, like most moving averages. Um, when it's green, that just means it's sloping up. And when it's red, that just means the moving average is sloping down. All right, so if, uh, so if the moving average is basically if it's sloping up and we want price above the moving average here, so like one here. So it looks like the entire bar is above the moving average. So, you know, uh, when you email your questions in, price could mean anything. So that's why screenshots are very helpful here. Uh, you know, so from looking at this screenshots, you know, if I look at other situations over here where the moving average is green, you know, I can see that the entire bar is not above the moving average. Uh, so that's probably why these areas were pointed out. So when price is above the moving average, you know, to me what that means is that for an up, for a long situation, it looks like we're looking at the low of the bar. So as long as the low of the bar, you know, the wick, in other words, the wick of the bars are above the moving average, right? That's condition number one. Then condition number two is a retracement. So we're gonna get, um, you know, price pulling back um, a bar or two. So, and it says here again, price needs to go below uh, the moving average. Um, you know, I'm gonna take a guess here that price would, again, would be the low of the bar. So we're looking for the low of the bar to go below the moving average and then so and then um, at the let's see so then at the open of the next green bar the open of the next green bar so um, you know I'm not sure what that means so when a bar opens um, you know it's not necessarily green or red um, but you know I think what this is what this third rule is getting at is that um, we're measuring the distance <clears throat> from the uh, open of the bar to the moving average, right? And there needs to be this kind of minimum distance here in such that the when the bar closes, the bar, the closing price of the bar needs to be no more than three ticks above the moving average. So um, now in, in order to know, okay, yes, yeah, so here, this last sentence here. So if the close is going to be under the moving average on it or no more than three ticks above it. So in order to do that, uh, you know, Bloodhound really needs a plot. You know, Bloodhound can't guess at where a bar is gonna close. Um, so uh, to do this exactly as this is written, Bloodhound would need an indicator that's going to plot the closing price of that bar ahead of time. But, you know, in looking at this bar, you know, this type of bar that's being used, it's very uniform. So we can see these reversal bars, <clears throat> you know, have an open price that always matches the closing price of the bar. You know, so that's kind of one advantage of using Ranko bars um, is uh, you you pretty much have you have um, uniform or uh, you know where really the bar is going to close in advanced. So usually from the bar that had just closed, you can pretty much know in advanced where 
the next bar is going to close as well. Um, you know, so we can see that if um, the bars are going down, you know, Renko bars are always closing at an exact offset price. And in this case, these bars are always kind of reversing at an exact um, offset, um, you know, from the previous bar, from one bar close to the next bar close, you know, you can, they're all, it's always uniform. So, um, you know, so since this is using a Renko type bar, you know, we can kind of do some math here. Um, you know, so this, so this component here that says uh, that the the close of the bar can be no more than three ticks above the moving average, right here. So rule number three. So I guess this bar here is a good situation. No more than three ticks above the moving average. Um, so what we can do is um, we can measure. Well, yeah, yeah, we can measure from the close of this bar. And if we know the length of the reversal bar, which I believe that length, um, I think these bars are like, uh, actually in the email, I think it said that these bars were four ticks long, something like that. Yeah, this is the NQ. You can tell this is the NQ. So these bars are probably one point in length here. Uh, so a reversal bar would be two points, which is eight ticks. So we can take eight ticks and subtract this three tick, you know, no more than three ticks above it. We can subtract that three ticks from the eight ticks. And so we can see that um, the moving average needs to be no more than five ticks from the down bar, from the previous bar. So we can kind of do some math to kind of back engineer this since we don't have an indicator that's, that's gonna tell us where that reversal bar is gonna close. Um, so that's it, basically. So we'll just kind of step through this um, one condition at a time here. So, all right, with that, uh, give me a moment and let me get my chart set up here. So our backtest Renko can look very similar to this Renko bar. S subtle differences, but what's important is where is the closing price of that bar? That's really kind of the important thing here. What's important again is the closing price of each bar. You know, so I know that the closing price of each of these bars is going to be exactly four ticks. And when we go to a reversal bar, the close of one bar to the close of the reversal bar is going to be exactly eight ticks. Uh, so that matches the bars that are on this chart here. So when you guys email your questions in, it is very helpful to kind of, you know, mention some kind of moving average to be used. You know, I think this is close enough. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the T3 here. All right, so I've got a moving average to use. Now we can start building. So we're looking for these the entire bar to be above the moving average, which just simply means, you know, we just need the, the wicks or the low of the bar to be above the moving average. And, you know, and looking at this, what the area that was focused on here, you know, it looks like we need, I don't know, a, a handful of bars to be above that moving average. So I'll say something like three. Yeah, three or four maybe. Um, so let's get Bloodhound open and we can start building. All right, so first thing we want to do is name our Bloodhound template. Um, there's our file name for Bloodhound. And I'm going to start working on the logic board here. So switch to the logic tab there, and let's start a new uh, logic template there. And we need a, a name for this. Oh, let's see, T3 with a max of five tick pullback, something like that. All right, um, so the first solver we're gonna need is a comparison solver. So, right, to make sure that the bar is um, above or below a moving average, you know, what are we doing? Well, we're comparing the the low of the bar to the moving average, making sure that the low of the bar is above the moving average. Or in the opposite situation, like these short situation here, we want to make sure that the high of the bar is below the moving average. So 
we're going to use a comparison. We're comparing the low of the bar or the high of the bar to that moving average. So we're checking to see if the bar is above or below the T3. All right, let's move this over. All right, so input A, this is going to be price. So we're going to change the type to price. And then we need to figure out, well, what prices are we using? So, so for a long setup, you know, we're looking at the low of the bar. In other words, we're looking at the wicks of the bar to make sure the wicks are above the moving average. So, the, so for a long setup, we want to use the low. And for a short setup, we're going to use the opposite price. We're going to use the high of the bar. Um, and then input B, well, that's going to be our T3 indicator. So let's just go load that up here. Put that in there. And I changed the period to a 5 on the chart. So always make sure that your settings in Bloodhound match the settings of the indicator that you're using on the chart. All right. And so now we just need to make sure that our outputs are set up correctly. Um, and the default settings actually should be just fine. So let's kind of take a look here. Um, all right, so we can see that, yep, yeah, all these bars and their wicks are above that moving average. And so we're getting a, a long output here. And over here, all these bars and their wicks are below the moving average and we're getting a short output. Uh, so there we go, there's condition number one done for us. Um, and as mentioned, um, you know, from looking at the screenshot here, it looks like, you know, we need a handful of, there needs to be at least a handful of bars that match this uh, condition here. Because I can see that over here, you know, this area was not identified as a long setup. Um, so let's see, we have one, two, three bars above the moving average, but the fourth bar is not. So yeah, let's require a four bar. Let's say there has to be a four bar minimum, um, four up bars minimum um, above that moving average. So to do that, we're gonna use the look back. I'm gonna use the look back node here. And this look back is gonna be a, a four bar minimum. All right. So the displacement, we're not using that, so let's set that to zero. The look back, that's going to be four, and then our mode is gonna be minimum. So now let's take a look at the chart here. All right, so as soon as we get four up bars here, so we can see we got bar one, two, three, and our fourth bar above the moving average, now we're starting to get right a long output as long as that's true um, until uh, until we get this pullback here right same for these down bars here so bar one two let's see yeah bar one two three and then on the fourth bar that's below the moving average we're getting a short output okay great so that parts uh, so far so good all right so now let's work on um, let's see here, condition number two. So we need a pullback and price needs to go below the moving average. So one thing that we're going to need is a reversal bar here. So we're going to need the indicator inflection. Right? So we're going to use the indicator inflection here to check for this reversal bar, make sure that there's a, yeah, make sure there's, there is that reversal bar. Basically, we're looking for a price inflection or a price reversal. And what are we gonna look at? We're gonna look at price. So we're gonna change the type to price. And we're just looking at the closing price of the bar, right? A reversal bar means the closing price has reversed on us. And, there we go. If we take a look, we can see all the reversal bars are marked now. 
And so what we're interested in is, right, so for, so for a long situation, we're interested in this down reversal bar. But since we're generating, we're producing a long signal, right, we can see this down bar is producing a short signal. So we need to reverse that. So instead of looking at the slope in direction, we're going to use the slope against direction. So if we set this to 1, so if we change our outputs here, right, so we, we uh, changed our outputs. Now when we look at the chart, this down bar produces a long signal. So there you go. So, the, so now we know that at least the pullback has started. Um, it's, it has started. And now we need to make sure that price goes below the moving average. Making sure that price is below the moving average. Again, that's a comparison solver. So let's grab another comparison solver. All right, I'll just call it the price pullback. This is going to be below or above the T3. All right, so you know this this solver, this comparison solver is going to be set up pretty much the same way as this previous one, but there's going to be some subtle differences. So uh, for type, again, we're looking at price. So for a long. What are we looking at? We're looking at the low of the bar, right? We need the, the low of the bar to go below the moving average. So let's use the low of the bar for a long situation. And for a short situation, that's going to be the opposite price. We'll set that to high. And again, input B, this is going to be our T3 indicator. So let's plug that back in there. T3, and again, change the period to five. So there you go, all of our parameters are set correctly. Um, now we need to get this output. Um, we need to get the output set correctly. So um, essentially, we just need to reverse things from before. There. Um, so if we look at this reversal bar, um, if we look at these couple of bars here, and then if we look at Bloodhound's output, right, we can see there's a long output. So when the low of the bar goes below the, the T3, there's a long output. And that's what we're interested in. We can ignore the short output for now. So the short output here that's happening at the same time we're getting a long output that's okay this short output is all going to get filtered out so once we connect all these solvers together this short output will get ignored in this situation so what we need from this is the long output all right so uh, you know basically when you're putting a system together you know sometimes you're going to get an output from a solver it doesn't make sense, but that's okay. You know, sometimes you only need one, you know, one part of a solver's output. And once you connect it together with all the other solvers, um, right, it all gets cleaned up, so to speak. So let's do this requirement here where the close, um, rule number three here, where the close of the, of the, up bar, but basically the close of the reversal bar needs to be no more than three ticks above that moving average. So, and we had already kind of back engineered that as the bars are going down, we know that, so for this bar setting, you know, this bar setting with a body of, um, well, with the reversal bars being eight ticks long, that we know that the close of the down bar needs to be needs to be uh, what is it uh, no closer than five ticks to the moving average no closer than five ticks to the moving average so let's set up that solver here so we're going to use another comparison solver and this one this comparison solver this time 
is um, is going to check that distance. So let's see here. So we're making sure that the close of the bar is going to be five ticks from the T3. All right, so let's change input A to price again. Um, and this time we are actually looking at the closing price. All right, so let's see there. So the close of the bar needs to be at least five ticks away from uh, the T3. So, and so here's something we didn't quite talk about yet, sorry. So when we look at number three, it's looking at the reversal bar. So, so in order for this to be done accurately, um, we need to know where the T3 is. Um, yeah, we need to wait for this reversal bar to close here. Yeah, so here, this last part of the sentence here for number three. So, um, so we want to place a basically a buy stop order at the price the bar will close. So, all right now that that's something that Bloodhound can't do. So this gonna, that's going to require Blackbird to place a uh, stop order where the close of that bar would be. Um, but for Bloodhound. Um, in order for Bloodhound to know what the T3 is going to be on the reversal bar, so um, this system is going to have to run with calculate on bar close set to false. So in other words, this is going to have to run in real time so that the T, the value of the T3 is known when this reversal bar opens up and then we can compare the close so it's going to be the close of the previous bar to the t3 indicator of the current bar that's building so this system is going to have to run with calculate bar close set to false so that bloodhound can receive the t3 indicator value um, in real time here so let's see so kind of knowing that um, so this this closing price um, is actually going to be one bar back. So we need a look back period of two so that we're looking back. So let's take this for example here. Um, actually, this, this spot's a bad. That's actually not a good, uh, not a proper setup. So let me actually find a, a valid setup here. Ah, here we go. Have one. Oh, no. Shoot, that's not. Ah, darn it, this wick here kind of ruined it. Um, so close. You know, maybe that, yeah, maybe this T3 isn't quite going to work. Um, hmm. Maybe if I adjust some of the settings on the T3. Let's see. Oh. Uh, Here we go. All right. Now, I, th I think we have one here. There. So we had uh, at least, uh, so what we're, right, this, this green um, racing stripe here tells us that we have at least four bars in a row um, that were above the T3. Although I do need to change the indicator settings in Bloodhound. Um, and I can see from this bar here, if I look at the close of the bar and compare it to the T3, that is less than three ticks. That's about two ticks, I think. So, yeah, so there we go. So we have something to work with now. And let's see, I, uh, let's make some adjustments here to the Bloodhound. So actually our T3 is using 6, 3, and 0.7. Let's make these adjustments here to our 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 solvers. Um, yeah, so here's the tree three being used here. So let's see, I changed that to a six period, so three and point seven. 
Um, yeah, let's see, this is also using the T3. So there we go, six. And then this other solver is using the T3 as well. Oh, actually, I, I didn't finish setting that up, did I? Okay, we'll leave that there. All right, here we go. Yeah, so now we can see we have at least four bars above our T3. Um, and then we're getting the long output telling us that uh, or at least condition one has been met. Right, there's condition one. Um, yep. And uh, let's see here, uh, something else. Oh, something else that, that's a part of this that hasn't been built yet is, right, the moving average has to be green, right? So do, throughout all of this, the moving average has to be sloping up or green in all of this. Um, so let's see, is the moving average still sloping up here? Uh, yes, it is, right? I can see the moving average is still sloping up there. So let's go. Let's go grab a slope solver here. All right. So we're going to check the T3 slope. There's our T3, and let's change the period. There we go. Six. Uh, so there we go. Simple enough. When the T3 is sloping down, we're getting a short output. When it's sloping up, we're getting a long output there. So this slope solver is going to make sure that the T3 or our moving average is sloping up the entire time of this potential, you know, trade setup. Okay. Um, so let's see, let's start uh, connecting stuff together here with an AND node. So I've got three components here connected together. Um, so this AND node basically is going to be um, rule kind of number one, or condition number one, I should say. You know, condition number one. <clears throat> um, So let's see, yeah, condition number one, the moving average um, must be green and price is above the moving average. There we go. Um, then we need a retracement. So actually, this inflection solver is a part of the retracement here. So that's actually part of this part here. So this AND node is actually condition number two. All right, so let's just take a look at condition number one here. We'll scan through the chart and see all the possible setups here. Oh, interesting. So, you know, it's a good thing we kind of looked at this because, um, you know, look at this over here. So we have a reversal bar that is above the T3 um, but, you know, judging from that screenshot, I don't think reversal bars are allowed. You know, I think we need four continuous up bars in a row. Um, um, no, actually, I stand corrected. So that's why screenshots are handy here. So actually, we do have a reversal bar um, in this here. So, yeah, so we have... Um, we do have a reversal bar in this. Um, so the, the moving average was green and, the, and, and all these bars were above that moving average. So, all right, so actually I guess that reversal bar is okay. So there we go, let's leave that in. You know, it looks like, it looks like we might have a short Set up right there. It's kind of hard to tell if that T3 is still sloping down or not. Um, 
let's take a look here. We can grab the slope solver, connect it in, and see you know, was yeah, is the is the moving average still sloping down on this reversal bar? And we can see it is. So yeah. So we can see, there we go. So this actually will technically qualify as a short signal. Um, even though it didn't work out, but you know, not not all signals work out, right? You gotta take the, the bad with the good. Um, so there we go. So we've kind of found a, uh, looks like we found a, uh, a long kind of setup and a short setup. All right, now next, let me take a look at condition number two. And actually, you know what? This, this price inflection may actually not be necessary. All right, so um, this comparison solve right here, right? It's detecting the pullback. Um, so good, I can see Bloodhound's giving me a short output. So in this short setup, I'm getting a short output, right? Once price crosses the moving average. So we know that we got that, that pullback. Um, yeah, and let's go back to our long setup here. So if I look at Bloodhound's output, I can see when, um, as soon as price goes below our moving average, I'm getting this long output telling me that the, the pullback has occurred there. All right, so um, let me mark this here. What if I just use a green dot instead of an arrow? All right, so we have this pullback here for a couple of bars. And let's take a look at condition number one. So you'll notice um, condition one here, we're getting our long output, but this long output here does not match up with the pullback, right? Once the pullback happens, condition number one, that the output is no longer true so if, if I take condition one, connect it up to condition two, what's going to happen here? All right, I get I get nothing here, nothing. So I need to take condition one and extend it forward a few bars, right? So that condition two and condition three can occur. So. I'm going to do is I'm going to use the signal extender. So this would be a job for the signal extender. And, um, you know, looking at, you know, looking at the screenshot, you know, it looks like the pullback bars, only so many can happen. Um, yeah, only so many can happen in a row before that moving average is going to reverse directions and that would then invalidate the signal or that would invalidate the setup. Um, let's see here. So it looks like possibly we could get one, two, three, four, four, you know, reversal bars and and the moving average will still slope up. Um, you know, here we got three reversal bars and that moving average is still sloping up. Um, so, so we only need, so, so it looks like we only need to extend condition one uh, forward for, let's see, one, two, three, four, five bars. So it looks like, uh, yeah, five bars will get us to that, to the, um, final uh, to the final uh, condition number three, that reversal bar, back in the direction of, of the moving average. So, um, all right, so our signal extender 
it defaults to extended for five bars. So we'll leave it like that, that's good. And the reason why I'm using a signal extender instead of a look back node is because the signal extender, if we zoom in here, it has this reset connector. So remember, a, a continuous requirement of this whole setup is that the moving average stays sloping up the entire time. So, so if the slope of the T3 changes, I'm going to use that to reset the signal extender. So now we just need to figure out, well, what reset condition do we want? Um, so what we want is the, let's open this up here, we want the um, reset opposite signal. Let's turn that on there. And we can see now that once the T3 starts sloping down, so when that T3 slopes down, the signal is no longer being extended. Right? So if we look at the signal extender, if I turn this reset opposite signal back off, right, we can see, uh, actually if you look at the green dots here, we can see the signal extender is extending our signal two bars past the green dots. But as soon as I turn this reset opposite signal on, set it to true, we can see the signal is no longer being extended and that's because the T3 is sloping down. Right. So, I'm using the slope of the T3 to basically kill condition number one. So the signal extender is extending condition number one here. So I can say, call this like uh, number one, it's the number one extender. I'll call it like a, a five bar extender here. Something like that. All right. So with that, let's disconnect this AND node. So let's get the signal extender connected into our condition number two AND node. And now let's take a look. Okay, so now here's condition number two. So there's our pullback. It's being marked. Um, and uh, price is still, uh, you know, not all of this is condition number two. So we're not quite done yet, but at least we have a long output uh, during condition number two. Um, and so now we need to finish setting up condition number three here. So. <clears throat> and that, let's see, oh yeah. And remember, so even in condition number two, the moving average needs to be sloping up. So I'm going to take, zoom in here. I'm going to take the slope solver and connect it into this AND node as well. Yeah, let's clean those leaders up. There we go. All right, so condition number two. So if we pull up the rules here. So right, number two, that's our pullback. Um, all right, so condition number two. Right, first we have to have condition number one. And we're extending that forward a couple of bars. Uh, the T3 has to be sloping up still. And then this comparison solver is checking to make sure that price 
has crossed below the T3 for a long or above it for a short. All right, so now we have the solver here for condition number three, which is, right, that's doing our, our distance check here. So let's, let's finish setting this solver up. Um, so we've got the name in here. So we want to make sure that the close is more is five ticks or more away from the T3. And we never finished setting this up here, did we? Um, so our distance needs to be five ticks. So five ticks, like so. Um, our input B, that's going to be our T3. Now we just need to check the outputs here, make sure the outputs are correct. Um, yeah, our outputs need to be reversed here. Much like, remember, the, the other solver here that's checking for that pullback. So again, condition three, um, we're still in that pullback for condition three here. But remember, so condition three is looking at that closing price and so what are we doing exactly? We're measuring this distance here. So there we go. We're measuring this distance here. The distance of this arrow needs to be five ticks or more. So, so we need to reverse these outputs like so. There. So there, if we take a look, um, right, so here's our reversal bar, which is the, the signal bar, uh, right? So condition number three is validating this, the, the signal bar or the you know, reversal bar back in the direction of, of the trend. Um, and so we're, we have a long output here. Um, so great, it looks like this is done. And um, yeah, actually, I think this, yeah, this guy can just get plugged in to this AND node here. And let's take a look. There. So far, so good. All right. So let's see. So this AND node is actually condition one and condition three. All right, so it's time to kind of scan through and take a look. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this looks correct, right? So the, the reversal bar um, didn't extend more than three ticks past, um, past the moving average. So let's say that. That technically looks correct. You know, this pullback here um, didn't pull back enough, right? It didn't pull back below the moving average. So, um, but of course, keep in mind, my moving average is not the same one that was being used in the question, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of this. Uh, and let's see here. Yeah, so this short here um, sounds like the short's kind of ideal because the reversal bar is actually um, on the uh, other side, on the opposite side of the moving average. So it definitely did not go three ticks beyond the moving average. So. Let's see what else we find here. So, yep, uh, this one looks good here. Uh, we did get a reversal bar in here, but that actually kind of, it actually matches kind of like um, this 
yeah, this first setup here, there, there was a reversal bar in the beginning. And then, uh, yeah, price moved with the trend and then a pullback. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, this actually doesn't quite look right. Because, um, yeah, condition number one looks like condition number one ended here. Yeah, it ended with with this first reversal bar. Yeah, condition number one, I think, ended there. And definitely, this does not, that bar does not qualify for condition number one. <clears throat> so it looks like we're gonna need some, some other kind of uh, filtering conditions. Uh, hmm, let's see, so what can we do here? Yeah, so I'm thinking this, this, um, right, this reversal bar back down should be uh, condition three, right? That should be the signal bar. That would be my guess that, yeah, condition three, is, right, is a reversal back in the direction of the trend. So that would be this bar. So once this, this bar happens, once we get the reversal bar back in the direction of the trend, that should um, that should uh, essentially uh, what invalidate condition number one. So that that should turn this signal extender off. Yeah, if we look at this, the signal extender is going way out here, a little too far, and that it would be. Well, that would be because, uh, yeah, our moving average never reversed back up. So it looks like we need another kind of condition here um, to turn the signal extender off. And that would be uh, looking for this reversal bar here. So uh, let's see. You know, I think that inflection solver I built earlier might come in handy. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, so let me set this back to the way it was. Okay, so here's what I'm doing. Right, I'm looking at the slope solver. You know, so for a so for a short setup when that slope solver outputs along in other words when the the slope of the moving average slopes up that is what's turning off our uh, signal extender so this uh, inflection solver I need to get it set up so that when we get this when we get this um, reversal bar which is which is basically should be the the signal bar I need this signal bar to generate a long output as well you know for a short setup and actually so putting the outputs back to normal I should not have done that I should have kept it the way I had it um, there so we can see now on this down reversal bar, we're getting a long output. So I can use this to also turn off our signal extender. So what do I need? Well, I need an OR node here. So we're gonna use the slope and this inflection solver to reset the signal extender. So let's take a look at this. And I can see the signal extender is being it's being reset a little too soon. One bar too soon. So what do I need to do? So this inflection solver needs to be uh, delayed by a bar. Um, 
So there's a couple ways I can do that. I could use a look back node. I could use the look back node and use the displacement of one. So that would delay right the reversal bar by one bar. Um, but this inflection solver, actually I can just delay the price that we're looking at. So this has a look back period and I can set that to two. And if I take a look at this inflection solver, um, right, we can see now, um, yeah, let's point this out here. So this, so this is a, the, a reversal bar, right? Price was up, then it reversed down, but there's no uh, inflection signal on this bar. We can see it's pushed forward to the next bar. Right. So again, the reversal of this bar, there's no signal on it. It was pushed forward onto the next bar. And this reversal bar was pushed forward onto the next bar. And this one, so we got three reversal bars in a row. And this reversal bar was pushed forward onto this bar, which is not a reversal bar. So, um, so there we go. So that should have solved this. And let's take a look now. All right, there. So condition one is now being extended until we get the reversal bar in the direction of the trend, or basically the reversal bar of the signal bar. All right. So now let's take a look and see if that solved the situation here. Yes, it did. All right, there we go. So no more signal in this area. Uh, and let's look back to make sure we still have our other signals. So yes, there's our short there. There's our long there. Okay. Let's see, I'm looking at this right here, and it looks like this possibly might be a valid signal. So, all right, yeah, so doing the math in my head, this this should be, yeah, this looks like, I think this would be a valid signal. Yeah, so let's mark it here, and we'll kind of figure out what's, why why is this not being marked? Why did this not end up being a signal here? All right, so let's take a look at condition number one. Oh, we didn't have enough. We didn't have enough bars above the moving average. Okay, yes, that makes sense. Uh, so let's take a look at this. So, right, so these solvers here are making sure that the bars, you know, the bars are above or below our moving average for at least a four bar minimum. And we can see, yeah, there's no signal here. So that's why. So there weren't enough, there weren't quite enough bars above that moving average. There was, looks like there was only three. Okay. So, so close. Okay, yeah, let me reconnect this up correctly here. So let's continue looking through the chart. Hmm, well, isn't this interesting? So we have um, a short signal, but on an up bar. Well, we need to use a bar direction solver. Uh, yeah, we would need to make sure that the bar is going in the correct direction. So let's throw a bar direction solver in there real quickly. All right, so this last, um, 
you know, this last condition here needs a bar direction there. Yeah. All right. There we go. Solve that problem. And let's see here. Ah, perfect. Yep, this looks good. So, yep, we have at least four bars above the moving average. The moving average is still sloping upwards. We had our little pullback. And then the, uh, yeah, the last reversal bar just barely closed above that moving average. So it's definitely that's less than three ticks above it. And same here. All right, there we go. That looks good. And let's see, yeah, for a down, yeah, that looks, that technically looks correct. So the, the moving average is still sloping down the entire way. Yep. Okay. There we go. Yep, this looks like an ideal setup right there. And uh, there we go. It kind of also looks like a nice ideal setup. All right, so I think we have it there. Um, so now, uh, again, to get this to work correctly, um, as described in this, you know, as uh, in order to get it to work correctly, to place the stop entry order, um, uh, you know, Bloodhound will have to run with this calculate on bar close. Uh, set to false like so actually let me um I'll set it that way right now and let's test this out let's see we got one two three so I'm gonna need to disconnect here and let me connect to a simulated data feed all right so let's close let's I'm gonna gen generate one more up bar here I'm going to set our moving average to the calculator bar close faults as well. Okay, so now let's generate this pullback. I think we're going to need one more bar of a pullback here. There we go. And so, yeah, there is our long signal uh, before the bar closes. So that would allow Blackbird to then place the uh, stop entry order, um, you know, at the correct location. So let's see, let's reverse this here and we'll make sure, we'll make sure that this bar indeed closes three ticks below the moving average. Yep, that certainly looks like it. Do a quick measurement here. And yes, that's actually less than two ticks. Yeah, so it's less than two ticks from the close of the bar to the moving average. So let's see, all right, there's one question down. Then that next one, pretty simple. This one's pretty simple. Um, so it's kind of hard to see, but um, if you can see the yellow square here, the question is pretty simple. When there are two Ranko bars with wicks like this. Uh, he wants to generate a signal on the second bar with the wick. So pretty darn simple. Look for two bars in a row with with wicks, and on the second bar, generate a signal, um, you know, in the direction of the bar. All right. So that one's going to be pretty darn quick and easy here. Yeah. So we already have a Ranko bar on here. Um, yep. Here we go. So we have um, two bars in a row with a wick. Already ready to go. So we'll generate a long signal on that second bar there. And, oh, looks like, again, there we go, on this one as well. So there we go, two wicks on that. So I'm kind of thinking from this screenshot that these are bars are probably really thick. You know, the bars I've got are only four, four ticks. You know, the brick size is only four ticks. 
the brick size on these Renko's is probably a lot larger, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, so I'm probably going to come up with a lot more signals than that screenshot, but uh, it doesn't matter. The concept is the same. So let's see. Let's make a new logic template. And so what are we looking for? We're looking for two WIC bars. Okay. So let's see. To, to find a bar WIC, um, you know, what? what is, how do you know, what is the technical What's the technicals of, you know, a bar having a wick? Well, uh, simple enough. You're looking at the open and comparing the low to the open, right? If the low price of the bar is below the open price, then you know there's a wick. And if it's a down bar, if, if the high of the bar is above the open, then you know the down bar has a wick. So that is simply going to be a comparison solver. Like so. So this will find Wix. Okay. So uh, basically we're just comparing a bunch of prices to, right, prices to prices on the same bar. So we're, we're always comparing the open price of a bar and Depending whether it's an up bar or a down bar, we're going to compare the open to the low or the open to the high. So, um, so input A, uh, that's going to be price. Input B is also going to be price. All right, so let's see. So um, for input A, let's set that to the open price. And input B, Let's see. For a long, uh, we're going to look at the low of the price of the bar, and for a short setup, for a short condition, we're going to use the high of the bar. So let's take a look. All right. So all these up bars have a long output. You know, so far it looks a little messy, um, but I'm just looking at the output. So every time. So look, this bar here has no wick, and there's no long output. Let's stretch this out here. Right? No long output on this up bar with no wick. Same here, right? This up bar has no wick, and there's no long output here. Uh, and let's see, let's check some down bars here. Here we go. Here's a down bar with no wick. And there's no short output, right? No short output. Okay, so so far so good. Um, so this, you know, log this solver looks logic looks correct, but to get rid of the other output, right? Because we can see we're getting long and short output at the same time. So to filter out, right, the other output, we're going to use a bar direction solver, like so. And let's join both of these together with an AND node. And what do we get? There we go. OK, so yeah, we're getting, you know, we get, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of bars with Wix. Um, and so now we need to find two bars in a row. So let's just use our look back node here, connect that in, so this we want, this look back we want a two bar minimum, so we don't want to use the displacement, we want to use the look back period of two and then set the mode to minimum, so there we go. So we can see here, yep, this reversal bar had, had a tiny wick, and then there's a second wick bar. So there's a wick, and there's, there's a, a wick. All right, there's our first wick, second wick, and then a third wick. First wick, second wick. There you go, down bars. First wick, second wick on the down bars. All right, so that was pretty simple. Um, this one's looking for pullbacks to the Anna Supertrend. So he wants to mark pullbacks 
So the first bar that pulls back to the Anna Supertrand. Um, and only the only the first one here. So any other pullbacks, we don't want to mark here. So the first touch is what's going to be marked. Um, all right, so give me a moment to set my chart up. So let's get the Anna Supertrend on the chart. All right, there it is. And if you don't have the Anna Supertrend, you can get this from a couple of spots here. You can go to Lizard Trader. So Lizard Trader is the one who makes the Anna indicators. There, you can see they have a download section. So somewhere in their download section, it's a free download. Uh, there you go, there's free indicators section there. Um, so there you go, you can um, get the Anna indicator from here, or you can get it from Futures.io. Um, so there's older versions up on Futures.io. All right, um, let's see, let's get this on the chart. Okay, there's our Anna super trend. So let's see. We need to find the first pullback. And let's take a look. What does this look like? Uh, this could be a minute chart, volume chart, tick chart. So let's, let me switch over to a simple minute chart. There. Let me take a look at the emailed here, email in see exactly what is meant by uh, first touch okay yeah it just says touch so all right so I'm gonna take that literally as a touch all right so let's see if I could find a literal price touch and no all right um, oh hold on a sec I need some live data that's my problem Get connected to the data feed. Let's see, that does not quite touch. Um, okay, here we go. There's a touch. Okay, here's another touch. Great, I've got two areas to work with. All right, let's get Bloodhound open and let's get to work. So, um, Let's see, I'm gonna make a new logic template here. There we go, let's rename this to uh, first touch of Anna Supertrend. And actually this is the U11 one, as opposed to the M11. There's actually two different Anna Supertrends. Um, so simply put, uh, well, I guess, so the first first part of this is um, is that First part is you know you need we need to determine the uh, the trend, right? So obviously the signal needs to go with the trend of the Anna Super Trend. Um, so the way you can do, there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, you can compare price to the plot, right? So if if the closing price of the bar is above the plot, then you know it's in an uptrend. If the closing price is below the Anna super trend, then you know it's a downtrend. But also, what's kind of neat is that this indicator has a built-in trend um, bull series. And I'll show you that. So I'm gonna use the threshold solver to show you this. So if we go to the indicator here, let's find our Anna super trend. You'll see it has, I'm sorry, it has a data series and it's called trend. So this data series will tell us the trend. Um, you know, so we, we could have used, um, you know, we could either use a threshold solver and this indicator, um, you know, has a built-in kind of trend um, output here, or we could have used a comparison solver and compared the closing price of the bar to the plot, you know, uh, they both do the same thing here, but but since we're using the Anna Super Trend, I'm going to use the trend here and show you guys how that's going to work. Right. So with the threshold solver, 
you do need to set the outputs here so there's no default outputs. So for a long, we want to look for greater than A. For a short, we want to look for less than E. And if we scroll through the chart, there we go. So there's, there's the trend. We can see the output right matches the plot. So as soon as that plot reverses, bingo, the trend reverses. Okay, so let's give this solver a name here first. Yeah. Super trend, trend. All right, so that's condition number one. Now, how do we detect the touch? Well, the touch is um, when we're in a long situation. Let's zoom in here so we can see that the, the low of the bar uh, went below the plot. Right, the low of the bar is below the plot. And if it's a downtrend, you know, we can easily see that um, right, the high price of the bar went above the Anna super trend. Right, went above the plot. All right, so that is going to be comparing the low or the high of the bar to the Anna super trend. So we're going to grab a comparison solver to do that. Yeah, we're checking to see if either the low or the high of the bar. So in this case, it's going to be is the low below or is the high above the Anna super trend. Uh, so let's get those that information plugged in here. So input A, right, that's going to be price. And so for a long, what are we doing? We're looking at the low of the bar for a long trend situation here. So we'll set this to the low. And then for a short situation, well, it's, that's gonna be the high of the bar, high price. Okay, now let's plug in our Anna super trend indicator. There it is. Add that here. And uh, so the stop dot plot is already selected for us. So that's good. Plug that in there. Now, if we look, um, actually we have the opposite of what we want, right? We can see that actually the, the bar that touches uh, has no output. So what that kind of tells us is we just simply um, need to reverse our output here, like so, there. Okay, right? So there, so we have a long output now Right, we have a long output on the bar that touches. And we can see we have all this right short output too. So the short output, it's gonna get filtered out with our trend, right? With our trend uh, solver. So we're gonna use an and node. So we want the trend and the wick touching. And there we go. All right. So now, the next component is we only want the first touch. So we can see here that actually we have a second, secondary touch as well. And also we want to make sure that it's a touch. So we want to make sure that price actually didn't close below it. So we want the first touch and we want to get rid of that second touch. So we want to get rid of that one. And we want to make sure that price didn't close below it. Uh, let's see here. Let's get rid of let's get rid of uh, this bar first. So if price closes below the Anna Super Trend, right, that that is not a touch. That's actually price closing below the Anna Super Trend. So that's not a touch. So let's get rid of that. So that's gonna be another comparison solver. Um, so we want to make sure that the closing price of the bar is above for a long or below for a short, above or below the end super trend. Okay, so let's set input A to price. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the closing price of the bar, so that's good. And now we need to plug in the end of super trend into input B. There we go. And 
we're comparing to the stop dot plot or the stop line either one works and let's take a look here so yeah so as long as the closing price is above the Anna super trend then we're good we're good for a long but when that close of the bar closed below the Anna super trend well then that, that's not good for a long that's not a touch so let's take a look at this and node we can connect that in like so there all right so it got rid of you know got rid of the signal on this bar here got rid of that one so now also if you take a look if we take a look at this solver's output here, right, where we're comparing the close to the Anna super trend, well, this also looks a lot like the trend. Um, yeah, that looks a lot like the trend. So we actually have found out, we discovered that we actually don't need this solver. We can just disconnect it like that. Uh, let's see here, but, oh, look, so actually if we do disconnect it, let's see, now we're getting a short signal there, but this high didn't penetrate, yeah, it didn't penetrate the, the red plot line. You know, technically speaking, it penetrated the blue uh, super trend line, right, because price is below it, but... You know, that's not what we want. So, actually, let's connect that back up. <clears throat> there. So we do need to have that connected in. All right. So, so when you're building stuff, you're always going to go through the process of discovery. You know, as you're building stuff, you know, you're always going to be doing some testing, discovering things, and you know, uh, modifying the system as you go along. All right, so let's see. Now the last component is we need, uh, you know, the, the question was to only see a signal on the first touch, right? And so we want to get rid of this signal here on this second touch. Um, so there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, let's see, we could um, use the signal blocker. Um, that's one way, um, but because this is so simple, uh, I'm actually going to use uh, the toggle node to do this. Um, and I'm going to use the toggle node because it, it, it's, it's actually a little more efficient on the CPU than the signal blocker is. This is going to be more complex using the toggle node. All right, so what we're going to do is, let's see, actually, the toggle node, yeah, the toggle node needs to be turned on. Let's see, like so, yeah. So the toggle node needs to be turned on, but once, um, yeah, but once we get the signal, so when we get this first signal, it's going to then turn the toggle node off. So we're going to need another AND node here. So it's kind of getting into some complex logic here, but so if we take a look, so our toggle node, right, connected into this AND node. And we're getting, we're still getting both both signals here, right? Um, but once we take, and we're actually let me zoom out a little bit. So what we need to do is take take the uh, the touch signals, and we need to delay it by a bar. So that's why we're using the the look back node, right? If we take a look at this look back node, we can see instead of the signal being on the touch bar, right, that signal was pushed forward one bar, so it was delayed by one bar. 
And so we're going to use this delay to turn the toggle node off. Right? So if we look at the toggle node, right, the toggle node's on. And so if we turn the toggle node off on the next bar, so let's zoom in here again. So this look back is going into the reset. And then for the toggle node, the reset, we're going to use the on signal to turn the toggle node off. Yeah, we need to turn it off and it, we need to keep it off. So let's see here. All right. So actually we can't, we're, oh yeah, we need something different to turn the toggle node on. So let's see, what do we have here? Yeah, let's do this. So, um, so we know uh, another way that we can, we know that when the super trend changes, when the trend of the super trend changes, What's happening? Well, price is crossing this plot line here, right? So we can see the plot line basically goes from down here when it's blue all the way up here to when it's red and the closing price crosses that plot line. So even though there's no connection, you know, there's no line drawing a connection from the blue to the red, but when you look at the data, right? the data shows that the closing price of the bar actually crosses uh, crosses the super trend plot. So I'm going to use a crossover solver. Let's connect this up here. So we're going to check when when the Closing price crosses over the Anna super trend indicator. So input input A, that's going to be price. Input B, that's going to be our Anna super trend. Like so. So look, here's look at this crossover situation there, right? So there we go. So when that innocent super trend flips, there we go. We're getting a kind of a crossover. So we're going to use this long signal way back here when the Anna super trend flipped to turn the toggle node on. What are we doing? We're looking at we're looking at the toggle node here. So let's take a look at the chart now. All right, so the toggle node turns on when price crosses the Anna super trend. And the toggle node stays on. It stays on until we get our first touch. And now when the toggle node is off, any of the touch signals now gets blocked, right? So when that toggle node is off, no more touch signals can happen, can occur. So let's take a look at this last AND node here. There. All right, let's take a look. So there you go, first touch only, and we can see the second touch, no signal. No signal anymore. So let's, uh, let's take a look here. And yeah, same thing here. So, um, right, no signal. So there's a second touch. And we have a third touch. And there's no signal on, on these bars here. All right, so only the first touch of the Anna Super Trend uh, generated a signal. Uh, same here. Um, so there we go. First touch, second touch, no signal. And 
let's see. All right, first touch. And if we go back here, yeah, there's a bunch of touches afterwards and no signal. No signal. Looks like that could be another touch. That is definitely in another touch, no signal. So, all right. So, we got another question done. Question that was emailed in from Thomas. So, I'm going to use the stochastics for this question. Okay, so this question kind of came in where Thomas wanted to use the signal counter. So this question is kind of about this, I guess about using the signal counter here. And so let's see, so to kind of give us a kind of a, a, an indicator setup here. So um, he's looking for an indicator, you know, that crosses 90 for a cell situation. 90 for a cell situation. So let me reverse the colors here. Let me speed up the indicator. Um, let's go down to a four. Uh, let's see. Also, let's see. Yeah, this is also using Ninja's default Renko bar. So maybe that'll help. So let me switch over to the Renko bar. And let's see. This is NQ. So how about if I do a four Renko bar? There we go. All right, so I think this is kind of what this question is um, looking for. All right, so I think this is kind of the setup here. So um, we have, um, you know, the indicator, you know, crosses the 90 value or the 10 value here. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to use the stochastics in this uh, for this example. Let's see. All right. So once once we get our indicator crossing the 90 or the 10 value, um, let's see. Then we're looking for the first price close inflection. So that would be this bar here. And then we're looking for a second um, price inflection, the second one. So here we go. That would be number two. Now, um, this this question that came in is about you know using the signal counter. He's trying to use the signal counter to do this, um, and you know I would. I, I'm not sure why. Um, you know, in, in given the, you know, in, in, in kind of given the description here, you know, I would think it'd be much easier to use the price inflection to look for price reversing down and then price reversing up, you know, after, after the uh, indicator, you know, moves above 90. Uh, but, um, you know, but to answer the question as as it was, you know, sp specifically written for using the signal counter, I'll do that. But, you know, but I would say to everybody else, you know, if, if you are doing something like this, using a using the inflection solver to look for this price reversal down and price reversal up, that's going to be a much simpler solution than using the signal counter. Um, but, um, but well. I'm going to answer the question as it was written here. Okay, so let's minimize that. All right, so let's start with a new logic template here. So let's see, I'm going to call this counting flexion bars. All right, so let's see. Let's grab a, oh, let's see, what do we need? Yeah, I'll grab a threshold solver. And the threshold solver is going to detect, you know, when when our uh, stochastics crosses that 90 or 10. Let's see, and it's uh, crosses 90 for a cell or a short. Okay. All right, so I'm, I just need to set this 
stochastics up in the threshold solver. And let's see, what am I using? I'm using four and seven. And the, let's see, the values I'm looking for is 90 and 10. And with the threshold solver, your, your values have to be in descending order. That's why 90 is at top, 10 is at the bottom. But C, that cannot be left at 0 because 0 is not descending order. So I need to put a value in the middle there. So 50. I'll just, doesn't matter what value, but some value between 90 and 10. So I'll just throw 50 in there because it's perfectly in the middle. Um, let's see, so the outputs, so uh, greater than 90 is for a short, less than 10 is for a long. So there we go, showing 90 for a sell and 10 for a buy. There, there we go. And so then once we get that, so hold on, let me, uh, okay, so there we go. So we got a name for this. So we're looking for the stochastic, um, right to be below 10 for a long or above 90 for a short. Okay, so now let's get really to the kind of the key of this question, which is counting these price inflections uh, that happen afterwards here. So let's grab another um, inflection solver. There it is, inflection solver. Plug that in. We're looking at price, so our, our input is going to be price, and it's going to be the closing price. Okay, so there we go. There's our inflections. Okay, there we go. The closing price inflection. And Thomas specifically wants to use the signal counter. So here's a part of the question that's not in the notepad here. So we want a count of what's being looked, what we're looking for is a count of, you know, of two occurrences um, to take place within the span of 10 bars, 10 bar max. All right. So what do we, so let's set up our uh, signal counter node here. So we're looking for a count of two and our look back period can be up to 10 bars. Um, and let's see, let's, let's set our output to digital. Most people like to do that. All right. So let's take a look here. So, hmm. Um, um, let's see, you know, my, I guess, yeah, my kind of setup here, hmm. Doesn't really work well with a 10 bar look back. Cause yeah, the, on the end Q, I don't know, maybe, um, Maybe a four Ranko is not good. Let's let's try an eight Ranko. All right, so we're looking. Let's see. The way I understand this is, um, so our, our stochastic needs to go right uh, into the ninety or ten area, and then we can start counting counting bars. So um, so we need to. Uh, yeah, we need to filter out these um, inflections here. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to need another inflection solver, or I'm sorry, another threshold solver. So this threshold solver is set up, right, to filter whether we're, you know, whether our stochastic is in a short uh, condition or, or a long condition here. But... Um, in order to get the signal counter, right, counting these price inflections, you know, while, while our, or I should say, yeah, while, during or, you know, at least when, in, in the area when our stochastic is, right, is in this, um, is in, is, when our stochastic is in this 90 or 10 area, Right, that I need to filter out these crossings, these uh, price inflections, right? Because with Ranko bars, we can see price is flipping up and down all the time, but we're only interested 
in these reversal bars when our stochastic is right is oversold or overbought. So I need to filter. Um, yeah, I need to filter these uh, reversal bars with the indicator. So um, let's see. I'm going to need an AND node. Um, and let's actually, instead of building another threshold solver, I'm just going to use a long short modifier instead. And what I'm going to do with this long short modifier is, let's see, I'm going to use the addition mode. Um, And we can see that what's the addition mode doing? Well, with Bloodhound, I'm getting a long and a short at the same time. So that way, so that way, when I take a look at the um, these inflections, right, I can get both um, short reversal bars and long reversal bars at the same time. If I just use the threshold solver. I would only get short reversal bars or only long reversal bars, but we're counting both. If we look at the, um, yeah, if we looked at the description, right, the first price inflection, we're looking for the first one, and then, yeah, and then we're looking for a, uh, a second price inflection. To trigger the trade, yeah. Actually, I, and I, yeah, I think. Um, oh, actually, hold on, just a moment. Let me read the whole context of the email again, because maybe I'm misunderstanding this. So uh, after reading the whole email again, let's see. Let me find a situation here. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So I think what this email is getting at is that. The reason why we're using the signal counter is um, we're looking for the uh, we're looking for the second reversal up bar. So we can see this is a so our stochastic goes right below ten. So now we're so we're looking for a buy situation, um, right? So yeah, so ten is for a buy. So here's the first reversal up bar. But what we're hunting for is the second reversal up bar. And this is probably the perfect situation here. So we want to ignore the, the second, or we want to ignore the first reversal up bar, um, but identify the second reversal up bar. Okay. So now that this is all understood, um, let's see. Yeah, I actually may not need this long short modifier. All right, so let's see again. Um, so we're looking for the second occurrence within a 10 bar look back. So, all right, so we need to, um, so we're gonna give, we're going to give this second reversal bar 10 bars. Um, you know, I don't know if it should be 10 bars when price first cross, when the stochastic first crosses that 10, or 10 bars after crossing out, out, out of this. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, all right, so instead, Got uh, quite a few uh, dead soldiers over here in the corner. All right. Um, so actually, I'm going to build a double crossover. Uh, yeah, a double crossover signal here um, instead. I think that's what this is getting at. Um, so I'm going to use, I need a crossover solver for this. So stochastic crossover the 10 for a long 
So it's going to be a long here. Uh, so we're going to set the evaluate, which doesn't get talked, which doesn't get used that much. It doesn't get talked a lot, but I'm going to set the evaluate to long only. And then input A is going to be our stochastics indicator. And let's get those values set in there, 4 and 7. Now input B, that's going to be a fixed value, and we're looking for the stochastic to cross that 10 value. Um, and since this is a counter trend system, we need to reverse the output here. So if we, if we use uh, crosses against there, so we can see when the stochastic crosses down here, stochastic crosses down. Now we're getting along when the when we get a down crossover. Okay, so there's there's one, and so I'm going to take a shortcut here and build this other crossover solver. So we're getting a short when it crosses 90. So let's change our fixed value to 90, and then set our evaluate to short only there. Okay, let's put this on the board. Let's take a look. There we go. Stochastic crosses 90, generates that short. All right, so now when you're doing a double crossover system, you use an OR node. All right, so now we can see both the long cross and the short cross situation. Uh, and so now, I'm going to extend these signals for 10 bars. So I'm gonna set the displacement to zero, set the look back to 10, and we're gonna extend for a maximum of 10 bars. Um, so, um, like so. All right, let's take a look. Let's connect that up. There. Okay, so now we can look for this secondary reversal bar within this 10 bar look back period. So, okay, so there, there's, there's our reversal up bars, right, that qualify with our stochastic being oversold or overbought. So now we can connect this in, into the signal counter. So we're getting there. All right, <clears throat> so the signal counter, what it does is it tells you, you know, when, when, so when the signal counter can count two occurrences with, within a look back period of whatever you want. So within looking back 10 bars. So, so what the signal counter is doing is, so from this bar, looking back, when it when we look back 10 bars, well, let's just say, yeah. So when the signal counter from this bar, if it's looking back 10 bars, it can find two reversal up bars within this look back period of 10 bars. So that is why we're getting getting this continuous long output. So quite often with the signal counter, you will want the signal blocker to accompany the signal counter quite often. So the signal blocker, let's plug that in. And 
we're going to need to block for probably no more than eight bars. As far as the resets go, you probably don't need any resets uh, considering the nature of this system, but just in case, I'm going to leave the input opposite signal set to true as a reset. And um, actually, maybe we do need to block for 10 bars. Yep, we do. Okay. So the signal counter is going to block for 10 bars. Yeah. All right. I I think that does it. Let's let me take a look at the chart here. So we identified this guy. So yeah, there's our first reversal bar. After the stochastic goes below 10. Um, and let's see. Okay, so our stochastic goes above 90, and we're looking for the second reversal down bar. And yeah, there we go. So um, there's our first reversal down bar. And then there's our second one. Right after the stochastic goes above 90. So, all right, let's take a look here. <coughs> um, great. So our stoch stochastic goes below 10. And. There's our first reversal up bar, and then there's the second one. Again, there's the first reversal up bar, and there's the second one. All right, I think it's looking good here. Um, and let's see, yeah, it looks like our stochastic just barely crossed above that 90 right there. <clears throat> so. Let's see, right there is where it, when it happened. All right, so there's the first reversal down bar, and then there's the second one. Okay, I think we got it. I think that's it as far as I understand the question. Okay, um, fairly simple question here. So we're gonna do, um, this question is just doing a bunch of moving average uh, comparisons here. All right, so we're comparing an EMA 5 to an EMA 7, and the EMA 7 to an SMA 50. And then as long as all, all of those are above each other in the correct order, then we also want to make sure that it's an up bar. That bar is an up bar. So, all right. So let's... Um, let me get my chart set up here. Um, all right, there's all the indicators on the chart. And let's see here. Oh, I'm on the MQ. How about if I do... Switch this over to a range chart. Okay, we have a lot of lines on the chart now. So I guess let me make the most relevant ones here really thick. All right, so here's kind of a situation we're looking for. Um, so the coral EMA needs to be above the red EMA, which needs to be above which needs to be above the white SMA. So there we go, this all matches up. So there, so we got the five EMA uh, is above the seven EMA and the seven EMA is above the SMA 50. And then uh, we're looking for an up, up bars in this situation here. All right, so let's get Bloodhound open. And we'll whip this up really quickly. So let's create a new logic template here. All right, so let's see, what do we call this here? So we got three moving average uh, stacking. 
So we need a bunch of comparison solvers. So first, checking to see if the EMA5 is above or below the EMA7. All right, so let's just plug these indicators in here. There's our EMA5. All right, input B, that's going to be our EMA7. Let's go plug that in. Seven, like so. And all right, there we go. Um, yeah, so as long as the EMA5 is above the seven, we're going to get long. And yeah, so here we can, it's a little easier to see. Um, the EMA5 is below the EMA7, and we get a short output. All right, done so far. Let's grab another comparison solver. All right, so this is going to be the EMA7 above or below the SMA50. All right, so let's go plug those indicators in. Go. There's our EMA seven period. All right, and put B down here. This is going to be our SMA fifty. So we got the SMA already in there. So let's put in a fifty period. And there we go. So yeah, the white line is our SMA fifty. And there we go. There's where the two moving averages cross each other. Okay, so now we've got our comparisons done. Now we need an AND node. Let's connect those in there, like so. All right. Okay. So, yep, so far so good. All right, our, our moving average are stacked correctly, but now we need to filter out the down bars. All we want to see are the up bars when our moving averages are, are stacked in the correct order. So, um, you know, I've already had, I already have a bunch of um, bar directions, you know, already existing. So I'll just use an existing one instead of creating a new one and throw that in there, connect that in. And there we go. Take a look. There we go. Up bars and our moving averages are stacked correctly. So we can see on, on this particular bar, our moving averages, our EMAs are not stacked correctly. So it looks like the EMA 7 is above the 5. Yeah. And let's go back here. Here we go. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Our EMAs are below the SMA, and we have down bars. All right, pretty simple. Oh, and well, let's see. Let's let me let me mention this last question here. Um, so the last part is um, they're saying that they'd like to see an arrow on the chart, um, if possible. But no, Bloodhound doesn't do doesn't do arrows um, it just does racing stripes currently so um, you know now that blackbird has the capability to put arrows uh, basically chart markers you know blackbird can put put these uh, various chart markers on the chart and now that we have that kind of capability created uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that um, once we get uh, converted over to Ninja 8 um, and we have the uh, you know uh, public release ready for Ninja 8 on that uh, then uh, fairly soon we should be able to uh, take that capability that we built for Blackbird and and roll that over to Bloodhound. So, um, yeah, so 
sometime, um, let on I'll have the capability to draw these chart markers for Ninja 8. So, but we're not going to add any new features to Bloodhound for Ninja 7. Well, if I don't see you guys in tomorrow's workshop, then have a great weekend, and I hope to see you guys next week. And keep those questions uh, coming in. Email those questions in for these workshops here. All right, and we'll get them answered for you. Okay, guys, with that, have a good one. See you next time. Bye-bye.